Well, good evening, everybody, uh, and a word of welcome to everybody from the uh, Engineers Ireland, the Agriculture and Food Division. Now, this is in, in cooperation with the Project Management Division, and uh, also is the uh, um, test, web test to uh, Cork UCC, Ronan uh, Duggan, and uh, the, the members in the Cork region. So, welcome to everybody. There are other people, I understand very parts of the country uh, going to see this and take part hopefully in it. Anyone can have uh, send in a question by email and uh, that will be discussed here, answered, and I'm sure John here will have the answer to all things. So uh, <laughs> um, anyway, a word of thanks firstly to uh, this, uh, the sector support here at the uh, Dry Road because they've done great work in setting up this, putting the thing in order. And I should say that it's uh, the number two of a three-part lecture series. The first one is over, basically, and has been a good success in relation to the, the ancillary wastewater facility treatment and all the topics associated with it. Now, that is done. There are some good publications out from it in, in uh, cooperation with uh, Enterprise Ireland. The second one is John's paper here. He just a comment, John Dowling from Project Management Group uh, is a senior, very uh, well experienced man in the, uh, the overall project management of the uh, large multi complex uh, uh, processing plant. Uh, and so he's an ideal man to give the paper. The uh, third paper is coming up on the 80th, just uh, to comment on it. It's by Dr. Mark Fendlin from Chagas, uh, who's in charge of the research and development, new product development down at Moor Park. It's in Moor Park, it's also webcast. So hopefully uh, the three uh, definitely will go well on the very interesting topics to the dairy industry, anyone involved, directly or indirectly. The great thing about this is all the sectors, all the divisions will come uh, and combine, uh, have to combine in something like this because uh, it's definitely the skills, uh, the talents of the various divisions have to come together to do it. And that's something that can't be said loudly enough. So, without further saying any more of those mundane things, uh, I'll hand over to the expert here to uh, go through uh, the lecture and uh, John Dowling then from Project Uh, thanks very much, Seamus, for the, uh, the introduction. Good evening to the people here, and good evening to the people on the uh, online. Uh, welcome to this talk this evening on uh, the essential considerations for design of a large uh, multi-product milk processing complex. Uh, my name is John Dowling. I'm a senior product engineer with PM Group. Uh, I've been working with PM for the last uh, three and a half years. Before that, uh, I've worked in Australia with Craft Foods. I also uh, have completed some work with APV in Australia and then back on this side of the world I work with CEL International and uh, subsequently PM Group. So that's, uh, that's who I am. Uh, during the course of the next 45 minutes to an hour or so, uh, I'd like to discuss just the, the, the whole realm of, of definition and requirements around designing uh, multifaceted dairy, com dairy processing complexes. Uh, some of, the, uh, some of the, the key items are to, to define the facility requirements, to consider the layout and the approach to design, look at expandability and future proofing, which is generally a big topic because uh, typically it's, it's, it's hard to know where you're going to be in five and ten years time, but generally at some stage the building the post facility will need to expand, so you need to consider that at the, at the very early stages and I think it's a key point. It also links into master planning, uh, whereby you also need to consider uh, what's going to happen in the future, and consider a, a 10 to 20 year horizon, and then just look at the overall design requirements from a discipline point of view. So consider uh, mechanical and electrical requirements, uh, site and logistics requirements, and also uh, other, other elements of design when it comes to big uh, multifaceted facilities. And then finally, I'd like to talk about the market value design approach, which is something that PM have developed over the last number of years 
and it's really an approach whereby you can you encapsulate all the, the, the clever thinking and put it into a, into a package which can be used potentially anywhere in the world. Uh, but I can give you a, an overview of that uh, towards the end. So generally the drivers and priorities for designing large processing facilities, safety is always number one. Uh, we all want to design the building to safe to work, safe to operate, and the people in there are working in a safe environment. Capital cost is invariably a huge factor, whereby it can be the, the which it can mean whether a project actually flies or whether it doesn't fly. In some cases, the project is too dear; it needs to be value engineered, and hence the cost needs to come down. Uh, other other drivers and priorities, namely, are good manufacturing practices and hygienic design. For dairy processing, in, in particular, hygienic design is a very high priority. Uh, we look also at internal flexibility. Uh, looking at the full site master plan, so once the site has been established and defined, we can look at maximizing uh, that site to its, its full potential uh, throughout the, the set number of years. Uh, sustainability and lead with, with uh, ever increasing energy costs, sustainability is, is always a key consideration. Lead is generally something that people in the dairy industry don't go for, but it's quite common within other industries where it's, it's leadership and environmental design and can get certified by the US Green Building Council, but it's a consideration that I think is worth noting during the early stages. Brand and identity profile for some companies, we all know who Kerry Group are, we all know who Glambie are, uh, we all know who Lakeland Dairies are, so they have their own brand profile and how that can be how that can be brought into to areas of the design as well, especially when it comes to, to architecture and signage and things like that. Uh, lean flow and logistics is always something to, to consider, whereby you would like the flow to be linear, you would like it to be uh, efficient, you want to minimize distances uh, as much as possible. Schedule is always a factor. Uh, the build quality and longevity of the building is also a major factor in terms of this building that, that, that is designed and is built is going to be around for at least 30 or 40 years. Uh, so build quantity, build quantity and longevity is always a driver. Uh, process conformance and consistency, which is, which is related to the process design and automation. Uh, efficiency and unit cost of production, whereby the plant needs to be efficient, the design needs to be efficient, and that it's, it's a fit for purpose for, for the business. And staffing levels and automation and the work environment are also fairly key drivers and priorities. So. When we're looking at design fundamentals for a large facility, some of the main drivers are, from the outset, is what you want the factory to actually process. What is the end product? Is it going to be a powder plant? Is it going to be a, a butter plant? Is it going to be a cheese plant? Are you going to do other dairy ingredients with on that site as well? So, I mean, it's, it's really key to define that early on, and also it has a big impact on how your site is going to look and what kind of buildings you need. The output capacity for each line is a, is a main consideration, especially when it comes to spray drying and cheese manufacturing, because it determines the size of spray dryer, it determines the number of, of cheese fats you need, for example. Uh, so the output capacity for today and perhaps future output, output capacity is, is also worth considering. The plant needs to be flexible to react to market conditions. It's, it's, it's relatively common that milk can be diverted to different products to maximize margin. In saying that, uh, Cheese prices, powder prices fluctuate on the global market. Some years the the the, uh, the, the price for powder is greater than the for cheese, and vice versa. So it's nice to have the flexibility to be able to, to divert the milk into the product, which is going to give you the highest margin. So the beauty of a of a, a multi product multi uh, product facility is that you can have the ability to do that. For why it's, it's it's good for your business. Uh, typically today, processes are highly efficient and, and highly automated, and hygienic design, as I mentioned before, is, is a key consideration and really uh, fundamental to the design. So, there's a couple of options when it comes to layout. There's, uh, I suppose, when we were, we, were, we were looking at this, we looked at the, the, the three main ones, which are linear, L-shaped, and U-shaped. Now, they can all be applied to different processes and in particular dairy processes and a lot of it comes down to how big the site is or even 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 it should be considered before you select the site as to how you ideally want to uh, lay out your process. 
So I'm just going to talk through some of the examples here of, of these three particular types of processes just to give you a background as to how the building blocks can be put together and how you can also consider phasing and how you can also consider expansion for the future. So there's a little bit of, a little bit of cleverness in, 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 the, in the next few slides that I'm going to show. So this one is, is a, a typical example of a, a linear type process whereby, whereby you have raw materials, goods in at one end or, or, or milk intake at one end, your process followed by your packaging followed by your goods out. So it's, it's a straight linear process with separation for your admin, labs and ancillary functions. So it's separated from the main process. The utility block is separate from the main process as well which allows the, the the utilities, the boilers, the compressors, the refrigeration plants, some of, some of, the, some of it is, uh, I suppose, dirty for want of a better word, but it keeps it separate from your, from your main plant. And then to the north, it shows an area which could be used for future expansion. So the next slide is an animation which shows how the future expansion could be used from a phasing point of view. So phase one would be, would be the item that's been highlighted now, phase one. Phase two is to the north, and phase three to the north again. Now, in this particular case, it could be over five years, it could be over ten years. But at least at the very outset, you've defined that the process is is or isn't going to be linear, and you've you've, you've allowed space when you're selecting your site in order to expand to the north. In this particular case, similarly, the utility block. As you get bigger, your demand for utilities is obviously going to increase. So the utility block is in, is, 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 is in such a way where you can expand to the north during phase one and potentially to the south during phase two. And also your admin block can be expanded as well. So it just gives you an idea as to how you can arrange this linear type style in order to expand into the future. So this is just another 3D image of, of that particular type of layout. The next one is an L shaped, which is an inverted L in this particular case whereby the process moves from uh, your raw materials in this position here and down and into uh, your finished goods warehouse and ultimately dispatching your shipping docks are, are out of the facility. Similarly, again, for the, for the phasing element of, of this sort of approach is uh, phase one, phase two to the north and phase three to the north again. So similar in some respects to the, to the linear but l shape in this particular case with the same functionality to expand the utility block and also to expand your admin block as your uh, admin staff number increases. Again, another uh, just 3D building block view of the WL shape. And then finally, the U-shape type orientation, which again, it's a U, and similar again, you can expand to the north in this particular case. Uh, now, why would you use a U-shape? You might be constrained in, in some respects by the side of the site, you might be forced into it. It's not ideal, but I suppose it can be done. So I'll just give you an example of, of those tr those three different types of of, uh, of layout. So I guess once the, the the products have been defined and you know what this plant is going to produce, you can start developing some concepts and doing some space planning on what the facility is actually going to look like. So this is just an example of how the building blocks can be put together. In this particular case we've shown expansion to the north where for example you could put a, a spray drying tower for example with a, uh, with, with a fairly significant uh, goods out area and your, your milk intake and your wet process would all be, would all be to, to this side of the facility. So really once you've, 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 you've sort of defined each element it allows you to, to space plan a bit better and to design your functions around your process. So the principles in generally and in, in, in summary to some respects is that it should be suitable for expandability because invariably tanks will be added, processes change, products change, uh, markets change, uh, new products come, come online, uh, automation becomes more advanced. So expandability and the ability to adapt uh, is, 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 very, is a very, very, very important consideration. The idea of single story versus multiple story well, if it's a spray dryer tower, invariably it has to be a multiple story building, which is in, in the form of the tower. Single story uh, for, for wet processing, and if it's a cheese plant, for example, it could be single story throughout. Uh, there might also be some, some economies of scale in building single story versus multiple story 
depending on uh, how big you need to have the structure and what the strength of the stuff it needs to be. And the construction grid, sometimes it's 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 uh, it's sort of it's, it can be a bit of an oversight at a very early stage, but it does become very important as you get into detail design. Uh, don't necessarily want columns everywhere within your building, so the structural grid needs to be considered at, at an early stage. Whether it's a, it's a 12 by 12 grid or 12 by 24 or a 6 by 6, in in, in, in the case of a of a dryer tower, uh, it's it's it is worth consider, considering at the very early stages. And also master planning. Uh, I guess in the last 30 years there haven't been any gainful developments within the dairy industry in Ireland. Bellevue, which was completed uh, last year, was, I think was the first greenfield dairy facility built in Ireland in over 30 years. So a lot of the older uh, dairy process facilities evolved and were built in the late 60s and evolved to the 1970s. So master planning and the ability to develop what you have is a key consideration. Uh, the sites that are there for, for older dairy processing facilities, instead of taking a short-term view of how to expand, it should be a case where you look at the long-term view of a 5 or 10 year horizon for that particular site, as opposed to just taking a short-term measure and, and, and thinking that, okay, next year we need to add in a few more tanks or we need to put in a membrane plant and we're just going to show up in the corner here because this is, where, this is where it should go and this is where it fits. But instead, you should consider the future horizon. And I do understand that it is a bit of crystal ball gazing, uh, but it's worth uh, completing the exercise from a master plan, view, master plan point of view because it, it really does, I suppose, focus the minds, number one, and focuses people in senior management to look at the, to look at the, at the horizon of where the actual business is going. Uh, albeit, it, is, it can be looked upon as a, a crystal ball gazing exercise at the same time. So here's an example of, of a site which is was kind of massive plant at a high level whereby there was a number of plants already within the facility and then the land to the side was kind of master plant, plant 6 and plant 7. So it just gives you an idea as something that you could do high level, particularly on a brownfield site, uh, whether there's land available to acquire or whether the facility actually owns the land. Uh, it's something, it's something that, 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 that should be considered early on. Other areas to consider regarding the site, and site selection is a, is a very important facet in terms of you want, to, you want to select the right site, you don't want to end up with the wrong site, or make a decision on a site which doesn't work for you and work for the future. So the, the site aspect and suitability is very important, along with, with the ground conditions if you're going to have an extensive uh, structural uh, uh, facility on it. Uh, other items to consider, which are sort of no-brainers in some respects, but they're still very important to consider, is the, the transportation of the infrastructure is well developed, particularly for dairy processing plants, where you have an awful lot of milk tank removal, because that's the primary way milk is going to be delivered to the site. So you're going to have a heavy movement of trucks, tankers. You need to be near near good quality infrastructure. The land needs to be zoned for industry. Again, it's a permitting thing. Uh, I have a slide on permitting later on, but permitting is something that shouldn't be shouldn't be forgotten. Uh, but the land the land should be zoned for the industry. Utility supply is extremely important. Um, water, huge use of um, electricity as well, and gas. I mean, does the site of natural gas at the very early stage decisions need to be made as to whether or not you're going to use uh, gas boilers, whether you're going to use CHP plants, whether you're going to use oil? Uh, some parts of the country don't have natural. Bellevue site in, in South Kenny to get natural gas supplied in from a good few kilometres away in order to get it to the site. So utilities is a, is a major consideration. In saying that, electricity also, but, but gas probably requires more of uh, more of a cost to get to the site rather than electricity because you need to uh, trench the ground and bring it, bring it across uh, the land. Uh, the labour market needs to be accessible. And then other international considerations, not necessarily don't apply to Ireland, but international codes and standards differ in different countries. So in earthquake locations, uh, different rules apply. And it's one thing I noticed when, when I, was, I was working in, in Australia. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of people working in the dairy industry in Australia were from New Zealand, and they were used to earthquake, uh, earthquake standards for, for silos. 
So obviously you can go in straight forward with the uh, zone and that zone isn't really punched for 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 New Zealand days. So it's just something to consider in, in, in different countries and different locations. Building codes differ and if you dig in that kind of design. Uh, it's, it's again something that can be overlooked quite easily. So from a process point of view, uh, the type of process and the equipment in a lot of respects will dictate your building size. And I like to use the term inside out design whereby your building is designed around the process. So as opposed to building a building and then trying to fit a process in it, it can very lead, can lead to a lot of problems uh, when you begin off for the process. So your process designers need to have a, a decent an input at, the, at, at an early stage just to figure out how much space they actually need. And it really applies to spray drying towers and, and, and cheese plants as well, cheddar cheese plants in the form of block form. So you don't need a high building just to, 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 to house the block form as well. And the spray dryer plant, you could need a three to four story building in order to, to house your dryer. Uh, there's a number of process flow considerations that also need to be considered in terms of pumping distances, uh, transfer distances for powder. So how you set it up and how you set up those building blocks all need careful consideration. From a good manufacturing point of view, uh, the level of, of care and audits are becoming a huge thing uh, in, in, in for, for companies today. So the, your location of your high care areas, your medium care areas and low care areas needs to be considered. Ideally, you want to keep your high care areas or your areas where your product is most at risk to contamination together and you ideally want to make them as, as small as possible. So the idea of keeping them together and not having islands from an operations point of view makes, makes a lot of sense. Because if you if you don't have them clustered together, you have operators changing and gowning up and gowning down on a regular basis, and it can be it, it can be quite difficult. To, it can be quite difficult, and I suppose annoying for people who, who who have to go through those procedures every time they, they, they need to access wet areas. Separation between wet areas and dry areas again, it's a, it's a given, but you like to have have barriers and walls in order to separate your wet from your dry. The lean movement of people for logistics and waste is, 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 is a big consideration. Hygienic design and design safety, so the hygienic standards, be it 3A or be it uh, European standards. ATEX considerations, which are atmos explosive atmospheres, generally pertain to powder areas in the, in the dairy industry, even though it's, it's, it's low level, but it's, it, is, it is also worth considering at the early stage. And then the use of 3D piping design. Uh, which is something that's becoming uh, more and more common with designers that it, it is actually fully designed uh, on 3D before it actually goes to the installation, installation stage. So I've put in a couple of pictures here of, uh, of, the, of some 3D models and how the building can actually look. So this is an example of the spray drying tower in, uh, in Bellevue that was installed last year. So you can see here the building height is roughly around 30 meters. Two, two spray dryers in there and going to cyclone and back into So the type of process really dictates the type of building that's required and it's a, it's a substantial uh, size of building that can use different, different levels. Uh, this is just an example of some, some, some GMP zoning and how you would zone and keep the high care areas all together. In this particular instance there's a number of, of dryers in, in this area where it is a high care zone so you need to, you need to gown up. So you are you already gowned up to get into a low care area in the sense that you have a you have a, a hairnet on and a, a white coat and shoes, but then you go through a further step to gown up into high care areas. So it's really it's really a, a control procedure in order to uh, minimise any risk that potentially pose to the product. So zoning up an area and zoning up your design is also important at the very beginning. Uh, I've mentioned three D modelling. This is a this is a, a, a model process model that was uh, completed by GEA uh, and it was used for the Bellevue facility. So you can see here pipes, flanges, fittings, etc. Et so that was what was that was what was modeled up and that was what was installed. So it's very, very close to, 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 to the actual oil what was installed. There's a number of advantages to this in terms of it it's very advantageous from a, a discipline design point of view whereby you have a number of, of disciplines working within the same space and it's very good for flash detection uh, uh, and for coordination of the space. 
So it ensures that when you go to site, when you are installing it, when the contractors are installing it, that everybody's on the same page, they know where the oaks need to be, they know what the pipes are, or needs to be done. And it avoids, it avoids clashes on site, which can be a very costly thing. Uh, so it is becoming more and more prevalent, and it, it is advantageous from our point of view. Uh, on the downside, uh, there has been problems with it with different vendors and different companies working with different software. One company might be using uh, Navisworks, another pattern, the solid works and trying to get them to talk can be a little bit difficult at the very beginning. So that's that's one of the downsides of it. But even from a, from an installation point of view and from contractors' pricing point of view in terms of, of defining linear meters of height and everything like that, it can be fairly well defined and fairly well made in terms of contractors giving spec to install X. It was always X, it hasn't changed, so the price, should, the price shouldn't change. In the ideal world, it should change. <laughs> Sometimes it does, but that's just an example, and I think it's a it's a, it's a good image just to reflect how what you design uh, in three D can be and is adapted in, in real life. Uh, moving on, just so, some other considerations in terms of warehousing and logistics and how they will affect your building and the ultimate size of it. Uh, your storage requirements, your number of silos your wet and dry ingredient deliveries, the number of tank days, they are very much will revolve around your, your initial definition and your initial scope. Uh, and you know, you need to it, it needs to be worked through from, from that stage to ultimately figure out how many days on hand storage you need for certain elements. So the same applies for packaging materials for finished goods. At the very end of the line, are you going to hold on to your goods for twenty four hours? Are you going to hold on to them for a week? dispatching just in time. These are sort of key considerations because ultimately you might need a really small warehouse or you might need a very big warehouse uh, when it comes to say powder storage for example. If it comes to cheese storage for example, if you're putting in a cold store or in a temple room, again how big does it need to be, how, how, how realistically how long do you want to keep it on site for before you actually ship it off. Now I know I know you could you could argue that this comes in later on during detailed design but I mean it does have an impact on your building. From, from the very beginning. Uh, truck movement and hours of delivery, again, it's, it's an important facet as to whether or not you need, you need uh, site security and all that, all, all those different facets. But truck movement, again, throughout the site is, 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 is a key consideration. Uh, expand a little bit more on your warehouses, the type of racking you need. Do you want high density racking? Do you want low bay racking? Do you want driving rack and there's a myriad of different types of systems out there at the moment. Uh, the hours of delivery and shift pattern, all all considerations and uh, stuff that really, really shouldn't be overlooked at the very early stages. Here's an example of a site or, or an MRD site facility that we, we conducted for a point recently. And this is a bakery and the building is extremely uh, extremely long because it's a linear process and it's what the client dictated that the process he wanted was linear. Uh, this item here is a, uh, a rack clad freezer for the product. So this is a 15,000 pallet uh, freezer effectively for the product. Uh, so it gives you an example as to how your initial requirements will dictate the size of the building and how it is actually arranged. Uh, so I also have an example of a dairy facility. Other uh, other uh, design development requirements really focus around utilities and uh, I mentioned earlier water treatment and storage. Depending on your site selection and your source of water, are you going to get the water from the local municipality? Are you going to store it? Are you going to have well? Uh, some to sit some days, some days, and have wells. Store their water, they chlorinate it in the facility. Uh, some others take it from the municipality. Uh, others try to recover as much water as they can through the process by putting it through uh, reverse osmosis plants and trying to, trying to reuse and recycle as much as possible, particularly for CIP. But water is, a, is an issue. It's always been free in Ireland, and now we have bills and everybody's whinging. It's, it's not a limited resource, uh, it's, it's something that I think others. Living countries like Australia, which have quite dry and they have a bill for 
couple of hundred thousand dollars in every month of water uh, you don't belong shortening your shower or uh, put in some uh, some water saving devices in the facility so water is is, is an issue and you know uh, the dairy facilities are very easy to use an awful lot of them uh, the natural gas requirements which, which, which i touched on before your electrical di distribution philosophy uh, is are you do you require enough power in your substation on the facility are you above 10 megawatts are you in the 20 megawatt region what's your ultimate your ultimate uh, electrical load going to be uh, do you want ups for your plc's uh, for for your chilled water duty standby requirements is, is that a given from day one that people are going to say yes i definitely want duty standby because i've always had problems in the past with not having spare when things have gone wrong so uh, again again fairly uh, i've seen basic considerations during uh, design development but at the very early stage they, they do need to be considered hvac principles too uh, location of your ahus some clients like their AHUs very close to their process so that they're not very long run conducting. Others have no issue with it and the AHUs can be uh, positioned in areas outside of the process and the ducting runs can be quite long. So again, it's a consideration. Sprinkler protection, typically this, is a, this can be dictated by your insurer, whether you need a sprinkler system or not. Uh, and what type of sprinkler system do you want? Do you want a, a fully, uh, fully full facility sprinkler system? Do you want a Air, air sampling type, type system which activates a fire alarm. So again, another requirement. Other hazards which 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 invariably pose some questions are: excuse me, your refrigerants, any ignitable liquids that are on site, uh, any other hazard, hazards when it when, when it comes to dust. Wastewater treatment plant. Your dairy facility is going to produce an awful lot of wastewater. The level of treatment required on that site uh, is something that needs to be established from a very early stage is, is there is there is it an option to pre primary treat it and then discharge it into the di discharge it to the local municipality uh, or do you require primary and secondary treatment and full uh full monte i suppose for when it comes to water treatment whereby you're uh, you're going through the decanter and you've sludge on off site and it's fully fully uh, i suppose self-contained water treatment plant and then the idea of CHP and cogen again with, with energy prices, they're not they're not they're, they're not too bad at the moment. I suppose it's the cheapest they've been in almost ten years. But uh, as energy prices increase again, CHP and cogen could be looked at. Uh, some facilities in Ireland deal with CHP plants, and they work quite well because you have high steam demand and high demand for hot water 24/7. The area plant will operate 24/7, so uh, CHP and cogen should all all be a consideration. And then uh, the uh, facilities and admin functions. So, you know, how many people are going to be working there? Canteens, lockers, administrative, administrative staff, uh, male female ratio, you know, all need to take into consideration, especially when it comes to looking at the admin plant, uh, and the admin area. Uh, and then the location of that, and is it far away, and you want to try and minimize walking distances as, as, as much as you can. And then way bridges and the quantity of location required. Site security is it required on a 24/7 basis? Do you need uh, controlled access gates? Food security, I suppose, is becoming more and more of a, of a key issue, especially with customers. And uh, when you see it become greater, so the idea of having fences and gates and key fobs is probably going to become commonplace. So you see the most of it get due to the food security. Uh, the need for labs for, for, for testing of ingredients and testing products. Uh, visitor access, disabled access, universal access in the landscape. So sort of all kinds, probably more architectural considerations around the admin block and what the actual facility is going to look like. So here's an example of an admin block which is separated from the process. So, you know, people who work in the admin block don't necessarily have to think of on a daily basis. So you know, they have their own their own separate access area, and then generally some sort of link corridor which will lead to the process. Again, this is a, a different view of the previous slide that I showed the bakery, whereby with the client in this particular case they wanted a lot of truck parking, so uh, we had to allow for for truck parking and staging that if, if trucks came to site they weren't actually ready to be uh, loaded up. 
uh, or or uh, unloaded that they could park in stage. So in this particular case, we looked at one at a security hut, uh, which would manage the, the flow of trucks in and out. And probably a bit of cleverness here in terms of the one security hut also acts as your main entrance for, for your uh, admin staff as well. So you know, if you're working with the admin staff, you would enter to this entrance to park the car to the work again, it's the to the facility. So this is, this is sort of a, a, an ideal approach. And then in terms of other ancillary functions around a particular site, in this particular case we had some uh, fire water tanks in this particular area, a little bit more truck parking down at the Rosine area, and then we just, we just positioned a small wastewater treatment plant in the corner of the facility, so that it's as far away as possible in the process. Now in saying that, the position of the wastewater facility is sometimes dictated by the topography of the site, and usually, ideally, it should be located the site in case of order and things like that. But things like the prevailing wind, uh, the site topography should should be major considerations when it comes to where you want to locate the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, permitting, as I mentioned before, shouldn't be overlooked. is a is a, is a huge uh, is a huge, I suppose, scope of work, and it can lead to problems, problems with schedule. Uh, or ideally, it should be it should be tackled, I suppose, in the, in the right in a meaningful manner. But I mean, planning applications, building codes, fire codes, environmental impacts are all key considerations. It's really engaging with local authorities and planners at, at an early stage to give them a heads up on the thinking of, of, of building this in this particular site. Uh, is there any issues? You know, uh, as well as IPTC, IPTC discharge license, which is your, your discharge license. Agency, and also during the planning stage, probably one panel to everyone look for environmental statements to see what impact a large uh, multi-part facility is going to have on the local environment. Uh, so, permitting shouldn't be overlooked and is, is a key requirement. This is an image of Bellevue, which is in South Kenny, uh, large facility. It isn't, it isn't, it isn't multi. Really, it's really a powder plant. Uh, two, two spray flowers, seven and a half trees, which are located in the, in the spray flower building, which I showed you cut off all recently. Uh, but in this particular instance, just, just, just use this as, a, as, a, as an example of some clever design and some how the, the considerations were both used in this particular design. In this particular case, it's a linear flow. so milk intake area is here, so tankers arrive, unload, leave, uh, if they need to, the truck wash here, if you need to get CIP, they can actually get CIP from the tanker area as well. So you're confining your heavy, your, your very frequent HGV, your heavy, heavy tanker movement to one part of the site. Second entrance is into your admin and your, your special ancillary function, so if you don't have any issues Cars or an entrance, so safety consideration. Uh, in terms of linear flow, milk intake, uh, silos, wet process area, separation area, skim milk silos, concentrated silos, evaporator is located here, into spray dryers, powder transfer across your powder silos, which is located here, uh, powder packed in. Bags, goods out area, this time. So, pretty linear. It, 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 it really, I suppose, exemplifies one of the points that I made earlier in terms of linear flow. To the north here, there are fire water tanks. There's a very small wastewater treatment plant in this facility, whereby it's only primary treatment that takes place. Luckily enough, there's a, there was a, a municipal ethanol treatment plant very close. So one of the requirements from uh, environmental protection agency was that the wastewater treatment be released up and then discharged to the facility. So it's just a number of tanks in terms of wastewater treatment in this case. Uh, on this facility as well, there are some fire water tanks. Uh, the utilities block is sprinkler protected, and the 
it's everywhere is all just going to protect from money. So not the full area is going to protect only three small areas and and we also make a decision based on which investment. But it gives you an idea as to uh, as to how I suppose the key thinking comes into it when you're looking at laying out the facility, particularly from day one. This is just a plan view of that particular site. Uh, and there are some I suppose other items which which are which are clever and have allowed for expandability that are worth noting. Uh, for example, your milk intake area here it's designed in such a way that the, the, the raw milk silos are uh, on either side of an uh, intake area and that if, if you ever need to increase your number of milk intake silos you can expand in this direction. Whereby Silos that are cold in the alcove mean that the yield of the silos is within some space. It's just a, a design feature. Uh, but if you, you can expand your, your milk intake itself, potentially the tank of egg can also be expanded. If you ever wanted to increase, like you install an over dryer, you need to expand it. Uh, your, your admin block can also be expanded. So I suppose it just shows and gives an example. Of features when it comes to how to allow for from day one, not necessarily build it, but at least you know that in 10 years time if, uh, if the demand for base powder or stimulant powder goes to the roof and they decide to do another stage on this particular facility, if the business case is there, then you know, they can do it. And this is uh, just a, an aerial photo of, of a similar same facility. So it just gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, so I did, I did, I did mention that it, it is a little harder than uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it looks visually I think it looks very good. I'm not sure how many can go in there or even driven past it. Uh, you can go past it. It's, uh, it's an impressive facility. And then quality and in terms of finish on the inside again just a couple of snaps just to the hygienic finishes in, in particular areas uh, at the top of the screen where, whereby uh, uh, very much dictated the size of the building, the table and the process, the wall finishes, the wall finishes, the ceiling finishes are all uh, to a very high standard. It's also worth noting that the spray dryer towers were uh, constructed in precast concrete, so there's no, there's no very few voids in the facility. Uh, years ago, spray dryers had Again, this is, I suppose, a close-up shot of one of the, the uh, points that I made about expanding your, your milk silo area for you know, future tanks to be installed here, and the area inside can also be, can also be expanded. So, just an image of, of, of a few of the, the areas contained in that particular site. From a construction point of view, it should always be uh, a big element, even from an early stage, even from the early stage. Uh, Buy-in from all stakeholders and process vendors and contractors can be a, a difficult thing to do, but they all need to buy into the construction of how this how a multi-classing facility is going to be is going to be executed. Um, and even items like setting up a site compound and, and considering the scale of the project of, 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 of a quite a big scale and magnitude is key. Um, and then construction versus operations and separation of the brownfield plants. At that point really is really about if you're in a brownfield facility, which is a facility that's currently operational, how you can expand that and how you can I suppose, have se construction separation between the operations and your, your, your new building. So effectively trying to create a construction site in an existing facility, which can prove quite difficult, but uh, it's, it, is, it is a, a key requirement, not only from a safety point of view, but also you're, you're separating your construction area from your operations area. Uh, so constructability is always, is always key. And again, schedule should be considered from day one, and construction schedule during all stages of design is, is extremely important in order to, to meet deadlines, to meet milestones, and to execute the project in the, in the manner you to set out from day one. Just to give you an example again of the, of the, the, the project that we've been we've gone going for the last uh, number of years, just to give you a scale of the construction compound and the amount of space even. I think that the peak of all the construction is 
So the key factors to success, um, number of items here, again, basing it on pre plan and construction and design, tailoring design, getting buy-in from everybody, working with project vendors, and you do have to work with a myriad of people on these types of facilities in terms of uh, project vendors, contractors, designers, so there's a number of people feeding into the same, to the same protocol. So uh, they're, they're key to producing project that Delivering a project that is fit for purpose on time as well on budget as well. So, the market value design approach, which I'll just describe uh, quickly, but basically it's a it's a package that would incorporate everything that I've kind of touched on today, whereby it's 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 a generic concept for the food and beverage industry. It's, uh, it's generally developed with the client as to what their requirements are and what their future requirements are going to be and where, where, where they see this are going over a number of years. So it's a document that forms a, a scope of works, a layout drawing and guidelines, and it's something that can be used uh, at the very, very early stages. It would have things in it like site selection guidelines. It would have items in it uh, that would pertain to GMP and what the GMP philosophy should be what the utility philosophy should be, what the wastewater treatment philosophy should be. So in where does it actually fit in the grand scheme of things? Generally it's it's something that can fit before site selection so that everything is encapsulated and, and the design principles and the and design approach are there for everybody to see. And it can be and should be a live document whereby it can be used over and over again. Uh, whereby uh, lessons learned during construction and during procurement and construction feed back in to the document so that it's updated on a regular basis so the next person that picks it up knows that oh we uh, put in uh, resin core on that job before and goes on the run before and goes on the run. So it just updates it, it should update itself and it should be updated to uh, to I suppose incorporate the lessons learned throughout the project cycle. Um, it helps in terms of it does the smart thinking up front and communicates on ambiguously with the local team. Uh, the smart thinking, again, of oh, stuff that I touched on earlier on, uh, it provides a basis for manufacturing that meets plant quality, cost, and safety standards on a standardized and worldwide basis. So it could be used in another country if it's localized. Uh, so it really, it really uh, I suppose, reduces the questions at the very beginning that you invariably have as to uh, what kind of pores are we going to put in, uh, are we going to put in false ceiling, are we not going to put in false ceiling, are we going to sprinkler protect, do we need sprinkler protect, so it really outlines all those fundamentals so that if somebody picks it up they know straight away that this is what we need to set it It ensures that the site is selected with the correct uh, area and aspect ratio that it is fit for purpose, you don't want to end up the wrong site, uh, boy, it's not fit for purpose and it doesn't meet the, the need for a 10 to 20 year horizon. Uh, so it's, it's something that the in group has done in the past whereby we've encapsulated all the, the elements in, in conjunction with the plan, kept at a very high level so that uh, as the project moves through its project cycles that a lot of the information and documentation is there for, for people to see and to, to, to use. It's, it's a tool. So that's it. Uh, I hope I haven't Board if you want. Uh, any questions? Yeah. There's actually a microphone, I think, so people can hear you online.
Yeah. That that was all that was all modeled as well. So the the Spring River Spring River model, page back, drains, where columns were the whole the whole building was modeled. So it was a number of disciplines that integrated into that into that one model. So you had HVAC designers, you had pipe designers, you had uh, sprinkler designers, all fed into that one model. It was time consuming and uh, it was a learning curve for all of us, but uh, it was time consuming, but we got there in the end. But it was very, it, Revit was the software that was used, and uh, those drawings were used the whole way through from down to issue of construction. So the model was updated completely. And the likes of the process then in this particular case for Glambia and the GEA of the process pattern for Glambia, which shows the process pattern for Glambia and that particular job. And GEA are the older. So uh, in GEA Ireland, you have the Mara, the Scott Dryers, the Danish company, you have uh, the evaporators coming from France, and then New con out of how to transport systems or how to transport all the systems in the place in New Zealand. So you had a number of different disciplines from across the world through these building models. So there was it was challenging, uh, but it was a work product site we ended up in the plan we found it was a work product site once. Yeah, that's a good question because I was a cash manager on some of it. On some of it, uh, at the very beginning, we had very little tolerances, uh, and it was something. It was something that we discussed and had numerous meetings about. But if we were, if we were back again, we would probably make tolerances. But at the very beginning, it was picking up a huge amount of clashes, which were basically clashes between the floor slab and the and the actual uh, screed, the actual screed on the floor. So there was there was a lot of that at the very early stage. So was a bit painful uh, in, that, in, in that respect, but as I said, it was, it was a learning exercise. I suppose a lot of it can come back to the real type of layout that you start off with. So, I mean, if it's a linear and you can place a plan be that, the, the powder transfer distance is between dryers and the, the, the powder solid is actually quite small. So that was a, that was a key consideration. And then your, your packaging area is, is adjacent to where your powder solids are. So you're trying to use gravity in some respects to, to use that. Uh, so it, it is, it's a design consideration. I agree, it, it, it is something that was, was used to good effect on this particular project, but you know, when you are on a brownfield set, for example, and you're trying to convey powder, which we have come across before, where you're conveying it, you know, over 50 meters, it becomes it becomes a problem. But in that particular case, you're very much constrained because it's a, it's a brownfield site. But I think when you're starting off at the very beginning, and you're effectively starting off with a blank piece of paper, you should always try and optimize the process as much as possible, so that so that you are you are having efficient. Any questions online? <coughs> okay. They couldn't hear me. I'm not sure if they can. I'm not sure if that's on. That microphone. I don't know if it comes up. If it comes up in the surround sound for you. Not sure. Yeah. Hello. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. Speaking loud. Yeah. 
Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, no, we got a query in to note about uh, sound quality. So apologies. In here, some, I suppose, infrastructural problems here in terms of cable. Uh, it wasn't able to resolve it on the night. But it's just in the theater here. So hopefully, when we got the messages, John was able to get through as much as we can. I think the, the slides were quite, quite comprehensive anyway. So I think even if you're uh, just got the, the visuals, you know, a lot of the messages through. One question I had, uh, John, there's a strong thrust on the economy. You know, we have the opportunity to lay out and as, as to make decisions. Is there much of that philosophy and thinking when it comes to the Brownfield project that, you know, maybe it's half the site is already used, maybe there's only a small extension. Is it the same philosophy or is there any different approach that you take? Is it, is it essentially the same ideas? I think you're trying to capture the same ideas as, as much as you can and within, within reason. Much as it can be taken. Uh, Brownfield's always a challenge because of what's there and I suppose you know, the, the history of what's there. Uh, and like I said, if you want to put in a new process, it can say you want to add in, uh, if you want to add in a number of silos, which is it's a very simple exercise, but you know, if they need to be alcohol, it can be a great challenge if you don't find room. If they need to be the alcohol, can't be extended because you can call to say, oh, I need traffic moving down the side. So that's kind of a simple example. Uh, but if you want to increase or put in another packing line, for example, to powder, and there was no room in, in the area for existing packs and what was, packing line was, and you have to convey your powder, your powder a lot further, it can be, can be quite complex. But you should, you should try and minimize the challenges and think about as much as possible up front, see how you can do it. I suppose, um, as you mentioned a point earlier on, which links into that, in terms of the short term gain of a project versus the longer term view, I guess. Yeah. It might be easy, as you said, to shove it in the corner, and even from a cost perspective, probably the lowest and, option. And, and generally, generally, that's why it's shoved in the corner, because it's cheap and there's room there for it. And it's a question of need the project done quickly to do it. But in five or ten years' time, in, or even less, it becomes a problem. Where he sits in the circle and says, Why did we put that pasture on the layer? We really shouldn't have. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think master planning is something that is, is overlooked sometimes, and that it's it's something that over, it, it is difficult to do, but it's a worthwhile exercise because it really tries to maximize what you can do with what space you have left on a particular site. And some people try to maybe fully things out in planning issues. Questions? John, thanks very much, Will Kern from Diageo. Uh, uh, not too bad, and apologies for being a wee bit late. No, you're um, fine. Uh, I, I caught most of it, and it was an excellent presentation. So, a um, question, or, general question I have regarding, I suppose, clients and energy efficient design, and are they, do you see a kind of more and more clients now seeking for, for seeking energy efficient design up front, are they looking for lead and preamp sort of accreditation? Is it becoming more um, of a of a an ask from a client's perspective? It is. Uh, for example some of the multinationals now are asking for lead certification as a bare minimum. Uh, for example I've just done some could be some work from Mars in the UK and uh, they want lead gold or lead to their facilities. So I think for, for some of the multinationals, especially in uh, convenience foods and uh, confectionery, uh, it is not so much in the dairy industry. Uh, in terms of energy efficiency, yes, uh, it's, all, uh, it's always a key consideration. But I think energy efficiency, a lot of the onus falls on designers sometimes uh, to ensure that what's been selected and what's been designed is energy efficient. In my mind, it should be kind of a given from day one that we are going to design something that's energy efficient. The, the, the whole idea of designing something that isn't efficient and it's going to cost you a lot of money in the long run it makes sense to me. Uh, but to answer your question, Briam and Lee with multinational clients, yes. Uh, but I haven't seen it as of yet myself uh, the rest of the industry. Because a lot of the time, I think, uh, the 
multinationals have a massive uh, sustainability and sort of social and responsibility governments as they form part of their corporate policy. So they need to be seen to be, be uh, being certified at their highest tax standards. So I think that's what's driving it. It's, it's, a, it's coming from the, from the very top down. And to be honest, I can't say anything about it. It's, it's, uh, but there's a cost that comes to it. Uh, if you are going for lead certification, there is there is a percentage there that you think that's reserved. You don't have to incur any percentage fees because you have to get a very good professional to submit all your documentation to the US Building Council or BRIAM, as the case may be, in the UK. So there is a cost associated with it, uh, but it is, it is becoming more and more prevalent. Thank you. so much and just one small question has the uh, dairy processor processing industry is, is geared up for expansion now um, I think as was one of the problems for them is the wastewater treatment capacity so um, if they have more milk to be processed the uh, nutrient load in wastewater will, um, the amount of wastewater to be treated will be high what do you see um, is or will be the solutions for them it's a, good, it's, it's a good question. Uh, I guess a lot of the, 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 industry, the companies in Ireland would have a discharge license, which whereby they, are, they have a set amount of volume to discharge into the local water course, if, if that's the case. And to apply for another one to get it increased can be quite an arduous task with the EPA. Uh, but it's, it is difficult. Uh, I'm not a wastewater treatment expert myself, so I don't have don't have the right answer for you, uh, but I mean in terms of increasing the wastewater treatment footprint and having bigger uh, population tanks and retention tanks for water and stuff like that would be one option whereby you would allow for your wastewater treatment plant to be expanded in the future. Uh, but in saying that, uh, trying to go for uh, an ITPC license retrospect can be quite difficult. But I mean maybe day one you apply for uh, a license which, is, which you're never going to achieve or you're not, you know you're not going to achieve future and that we have that bit of buffer up your sleeve that if uh, if expansion does occur then you don't have to reapply. Yeah recycling the water is a good point. It, if it's if it's a large multi processing facility and especially if you're doing an awful lot of uh, evaporation you can actually uh, try and put your uh, evaporated water through an oil pan and recycle. So, the case in point being, being Zambia, what, what, what they're actually doing is they're recycling most of their water from the Africa. So, they're actually, uh, they're actually putting, that, putting that through a uh, reverse augmentation plant and they're putting it through a UV treatment and then they're actually using it for CO2 water. And also, they're also in the process, and they're using it in the So, it's obviously such a high quality after the water process. But it depends on the, it depends on the process in some respects that it needs to be constant all the time. So I think two dryers down there are constantly doing their, their evaporating skim milk coil. If you're evaporating whey powder, I'm not sure whether or not there's organic content in the in the water coming off it that won't walk through an RO membrane filtration system. I don't know enough about that, but I know in some places where the question is asked, like I said they can't they, they can't do it because they travel their RO plant and it's not conducive to to that. And plus, they, they might change, they might have a multi use evaporator where they, they're using it for skim milk, and then they're dispersing, and they're using it you know, for whey or at other times of the year. So, if you have a facility like that, to have that flexibility to do it might be quite difficult. But recycling the water should be, should be in some respects, a priority, but it's very much focused on.
It is, yeah. Here they are. Yeah. Well, they don't have a well on that particular site, so they're, they're taking water, water from the plants. So, and like they wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't be able to supply the new water required. And I, th I think, I think the plan B is wastewater treatment plant in Bandaragan is the biggest thing in Ireland. They take the they, 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 Run through your condensers, and you can even take the extreme. So there, there are some uses, but the amount of generators you would be able to use in that generator, especially if you're using that console. Kind of yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it's amazing how technology has come on and people's attitude has changed. I mean, pulling that good stuff down the drain, I mean, years ago, they used to put way down the drain because it seemed to wipe off the cheese, and now it's a huge decrease. But the amount of whey protein that's available on the market 20 years ago, they used to feed it to pigs. Yeah, 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 they were, they were bodybuilder pigs, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, technology seems to be, there's, there's just from reading the media, there's always, there's always talk of how to uh, reduce water for CIP and some new technology that's come on stream that you don't need to have hot water for CIP, you can CIP it from the degrees because you can you know, change the chemistry of the water in such a way that, that it will kill, kill everything in the, in the system. So I think there probably will be some advances there in the next number of years, but at the moment in the dairy industry, 75 degrees, caustic, nitric acid, wash, you know, tried and tested. Done. Your protein will be killed, you know, and there are any fat that's not in the fight. But so I mean, for someone to move away from that kind of tried and tested method is a bit of a leap of faith. But maybe some of the smaller players will and that will go go out the line. Huge issue. Huge issue. Yeah. But even 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 I remember in uh, in Australia, like you, you think here, there's a mentality here that all oh, you know, you put a well into your house, you just get get, get the local lad out, drill down 120, 140 feet, whatever it is, and you can drink it. You do that in Australia and you can't drink the water. It's full of iron, it's full of some sort of other mineral and to treat it is huge one. So, you know, we just start taking, we do certainly take that for granted here, our, our, our water as well. It is, there's a lot of, there's an awful lot of information. In some respects, they did allow for adding in a lot of refrigeration plants, which I think they will have to come through in the near future. So, one of the work process areas has two stories about it. So, they did allow for adding in some, some future expansion. And also, in the, in the Hits and Mins area as well, it's also conducive to expanding. 
So they have considered, I suppose, the five or ten year horizon. Uh, in that particular plant, with two dry running, you're going to be, you be consuming an awful lot of milk to feed both of them. So I guess Bally Ragged, in a lot of respects, gives Glamby a bit of diversity in a way. If, if uh, global prices are right, they can put all the milk to and tell you So the cheese plant in Bally Ragged. The point about trying to retrofit new technology into the ground field is just all the time. But there's no panacea that we need to see. Yeah. In a lot of cases, they're talking about the pump that's strip out and new floors and adding on to the building extension. It's always a factor as well. Process is all key, and trying to get a process shut down to do a retrofit or trying to get windows to do is always difficult because if your process isn't going, you're not making money. So, the way it's looked, engineering, maintenance, small projects always have that challenge with, with the operations because process is always number one. I suppose process integration, process integration would be would be the biggest challenge. Okay. Trying to get all your designers on the same page as well as your vendors on the same page and come up with a proper collaborative approach because just there's so many different opinions on how you should do stuff. Uh, process vendors, a lot of cases they don't care about the building, they care about the process. They know how big it is and they just want to pump it on the floor pipe it up and get it going. They don't care where where the operator is coming from, how it's accessed, how it's maintained, uh, whether you want to expand it, how you, you know. It, it, that's, probably the, that's probably what I have found always the, the biggest challenge. Uh, I suppose when it comes to utilities as well, HVAC can always prove uh, tricky enough in terms, of, in, terms of, in terms of the size of it and the size of the ducting and how much space and how much space it can take up. I mean, Looking at processes is a big difference between a 75 and a 5 and a 1 liter square ducked. A big difference. Exactly. Exactly. So, like it was it was a good exercise on Bellevue in terms of I think everybody saw the benefit of uh, the building PM uh, in the in the long run. But I suppose the upfront cost has to be borne by somebody and they need to see that. Both this approach, then there are long term benefits down the line when it comes to the drums and the top of the contract that can get the job done. And after they come back and make these extra production, the site manager pulling his hair out because you know, it would be a case of the process space and first in the stress. I've been on sites before where the electrical contractor got in, just ran hand cable tray everywhere, you know, and not didn't, didn't give didn't care or took no consideration to anybody else. So, especially when it comes to rooms. Seating boards and things like that. If you want to be really clever with everything, it's, uh, it's a very workable exercise. And it's used extensively on the plant shape industry. Do you want to just wrap it up, uh, Shane? So, do you want to say anything here? Or? Thanks, John. Uh, that was was uh, refreshing. Number one and very informative. Number two, and hopefully to everybody.
Uh, and, uh, one mistake of mine at the outset, I should have mentioned the RIAI. Uh, welcome, a word of welcome to them. They're here uh, on webcast, I understand. So, um, the great points, as far as I can see from the paper, uh, to us all, the, the great points uh, really of information for the future, and future planning is uh, uh, the process that's there, and I suppose it will, to some degree, relate to the next lecture in this series, uh, what's coming up to me. And that probably goes above engineering to some degree, in that uh, the opportunities are there. And someone at board level has to decide, can I take a risk making this thing down the line, will it sell? Now, that's not our business at the moment. That's not what we're addressing. We should possibly be part of the lecture series, but uh, uh, we haven't. Now, it's another issue. The other uh, points, I think, great points that have come out of it is the, the process dictates um, um, virtually everything related and the modular design and also the modular design of the process as part of that. In other words, every unit module, hopefully within uh, reasons, determines the unit operation, how it's laid out and how it can be duplicated and the rest. Um, points that uh, uh, have been made there well by John, the planning regulations, uh, for any upgrade modification for any new application at the moment, uh, the, the permits, etc., that are going to, and the limitations relating to them, are going to become a major issue, I'd say, with the national bodies as time goes on. There's no question there. And as engineers, we're going to have to meet that, uh, and for that matter, have the technical answer. It's going to get it through, because knowing that we're going to be easier as time goes on. Um, the Design, the time has come when very little design, it's not 3D design in the process industry, I think can be accommodated. It's as simple as that. We're into that area, into that era, and you start from, in my book, you start from a PID, and you carry it through to the end. The PID virtually dictates everything. In other words, the, the procurement at the end of the line can be taken from the PID. Um, that is pretty common, it's, it's been done in the process industry across the board at the moment, so there's no reason why uh, it shouldn't be sold by us as engineers. Water resources, uh, not necessarily in order of importance here because it's just a few points that I noted. Water resources, uh, as John has said, uh, have been assumed in Ireland. That's, that's probably an ignorant statement to you, but in other words, we have water anyway, that's so don't worry about it. Now, the point is that doesn't apply any longer. And Irish water are here. It's the media representative listening from Irish water. And uh, they basically will require the, their, their specific requirements in relation to water. Their policy has to be implemented, and we must, as engineers, stay with it and work with them. Uh, it would be interesting for the industry to hear their policy lessons. Uh, the separate um, the areas of, of the, that, he, that John has uh, outlined there, the administration as a separate entity, seems a great idea to me and those industries. Uh, and that applies not alone in industry, it applies definitely in municipals. Um, the one point that I suppose could be mentioned is the requirements of the fire officer. Uh, and in any, for any new development, for that matter, the extension of any, any existing development at the moment, the fire officers are becoming more demanding. Insurances obviously relate to that. So it's an issue that, as engineers, uh, for any new development, I think we have to keep in mind. As John said out there. Um, ongoing risk review. And I suppose that starts from, in my book, from R&D. In other words, a product is designed, what's the risk in manufacturing it, uh, that number one, it will compete in the international market, number two, that the investor who's going to manufacture it uh, is not carrying his money down the drain. Now, from there on to the various elements of the process design, uh, and for that matter, uh, going through for the integration then of the unit operations that come uh, from the, the, the various suppliers, uh, specialists, as, as John has gone through there. It could be from anywhere in the world at this stage. And we need to look at it that way. In other words, 
uh, uh, you go for high quality design, it doesn't matter where it's from. Um, then I, I, I think basically the, the overall um, the permutations and combinations of uh, the, uh, I suppose the project management approach is an important one in all this. In other words, how you uh, take the management of the project so that you work within a program and uh, minimum cost, minimum total cost. And I suppose I could emphasize that one specifically from the few jobs I've been involved in and the dearest to say it. Now, the point is, uh, John has made that point, a lot of it comes, what is what the capital budget is available to do the job. It's a, a challenge for a board and any company. It's definitely, is becoming, I think it's recognised now more than it was, is that uh, if you spend more money at the outset, and it's, it has been thought, thought through logically, then you probably get a cheap answer. The payback period is important in that sense, which is another major issue to be addressed at the outset for the end of the year. So, I won't say any more. Basically, uh, we couldn't get a better presentation. And uh, thanks very much, Don, and everyone you have.